Hi, this is DJ Fat Tony and you're listening to the ACS show. Tony looks very serious right now. I'm right. always serious. Right, Tony, me and E were talking. We were wondering, is it Fat Tony we refer to you as? Yeah, or it's Tony? Tony, isn't it? Just Tony. Unless you're paying me like vast amounts of money, then you can call me Fat Tony. <laughs> and where did the name come from, Fat Tony? I used to be fat. It's this really it. simple story. <laughs> when I was like 14, I had a series of uh, incidents that happened, like, you know, uh, and it, there was abuse as a kid so mm. basically by the time I got to 14 I kind of had this layer of fat as a protection so mm. no one would come near me it was like a barrier mm-hmm. so that's where it come and people kind of whispered it behind my back you know like which Tony oh fat Tony so I just kind of owned it it's yeah. good why and not I, I, I took it for myself I just thought you know you're going to call me out I'll call it myself it doesn't bother me yeah, true. True. and then lost all the weight and showed them all and now look at you, you exactly. <laughs> you know what I mean? Is there any other names? Now who's winning? Yeah, you. <laughs> Is there any other names people call you now? <laughs> well, yeah, King. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no. that's, that's so, you know, listen, and everyone has an opinion and everyone has a name for someone. So, yeah. you know, whether they say it to my face and they have the quality of life to say it to my face, you know, it's entirely up to them. But most people don't. And pretty polite these days. Good. Yes. I tried not to piss people off. <laughs> so whereabouts did you grow up? I'm sure it wasn't London, was it? Yeah. It was London. <laughs> what? I don't yeah, know. Yeah, you've London just, you've got, yeah, I'm in London. You've got this country vibe to you. No, nah, so. you're mental, ain't you? Okay. <laughs> I, I was, I, so I was born in Pimlico and I grew okay. up in Battersea. Okay. Uh, and kind of from Battersea, moved all around London and then all around, kind of lived in New York for a while. Uh, I lived in Old Compton Street from the age of six, 17 onwards mm-hmm. for about 15 years. So, yeah, no, I'm, I'm London born and bred. Amazing. And, uh, Country vibe, man. Yeah, no. You could walk out know, of here. I don't know, there's something about it that just feels a bit more like... Margate. Not even Margate. <laughs> Westgate. <laughs> I was thinking more like Brighton. Oh my God, you're going to get slapped up. Oh man. <laughs> you need to get Brighton. Yeah, like you're from Hove, actually. <laughs> <laughs> you're dubbed the meme master. Oh uh, Yeah, right. Where did the, how did that all just, begin? It kind of like... Um, it's just like an, a third arm. You know, it's yeah. like... It's another extension of my... Of my uh, no, like a sense of humour. For me, I post things, just literally just started posting random rubbish that I found funny. Mm. Other people's pictures, you know, people pictures of people's kids, dogs, you know, all that stuff that I found funny and it just came from there. So and there's not like a massive team behind you? No, 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 it's just me. That's good. And people don't believe that because I post like 10 times a day, right? Yeah, Because yeah. I found one and I was trying to look for it again and I yeah, realised no, there's yeah, 10 things since Literally, then, yeah. the algorithms love me. Yeah. Like, I literally post 10 times a day. But it, what it is, is kind of, you know, as I said before, I've got ADHD. So for me... That's just like, I'm constant. I'm thinking, well, I've done that now. I need to do another one. And it's, and I'm a collector. I'm like, I literally have, I collect memes. And it sounds really weird. People collect like, you know, art. So for me, they're bits of art. Do you make make some? So you add the text onto the memes as well. We make some, we steal some, we rob some, we get sent some. You know, it's a collection. You know, literally, I love it when people, I repost stuff and people go, "Uh, you didn't credit me. And it's like, this isn't the Yours. Louvre. Yeah, this yeah, isn't yeah. the Louvre. This is Instagram. Do you understand how Instagram works? It's saying that. Reposting though. people's pictures. Saying yeah. that though. So we were speaking to someone earlier and they actually said that they feel like memes in general now mm. are like the modern day It totally art. is. It is art. Yeah. It is art. And, you know, it's, it's, it's a really, really strong platform. Because for someone like me that finds humour in real dark places, you know, I, you know, for me, I post a lot of drug related memes. I post a lot of trauma related memes mm-hmm. because I I laugh at that stuff now because I've conquered that stuff. So therefore, mm-hmm. it gives me a right to laugh at it. Of course, and I laugh at it because they were my mistakes. Mm-hmm. And if you laugh at your own mistakes, right, yeah, then you've conquered those mistakes. Do you, do you remember your first ever meme? Mm, no so you don't remember there no. must be like a meme that made you feel like you know what I'm going to post that oh, you and know, that kind of set it off yeah the, the dog the, there's a meme with this, his dog with the he's got his arm up across, and he's, there's, there's someone in the front cut seat driving and the dog's leaning looking oh, back I've seen that yeah yeah, 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 over, yeah, yeah. The, over the car and he's like uh, I'm with your dad now <laughs> yeah, and you will obey me and it's like that, that was my That's first meme. meme I just thought oh my god I love this it's the best meme ever you know because it's just Literally, they weren't memes then. They didn't have a name. It was just this whatever. random yeah, funny yeah. stuff. Amazing. You know, like babies shitting all over people and things like that. You know, come on. Yeah. Of course. So there's two clubs that obviously way before my time. Mm. Um, Limelight. Yeah. 
and Wag Club. Wag, man. Wag, if it, you know, the Wag was the Wag was everything, really. You know, London was like um, London was four streets, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. the clubbing universe of London was mm -hmm. four streets in the West End. Mm -hmm. You had Water Street, Dean Street, Frith Street, mm -hmm. and then you had Charing Cross, like a like a by Centre Point, Charing yes. Cross Road. So that was your clubbing area. So that was kind of that's what the the mecca that everyone flocked to, mm -hmm. and in those days, the Wag Club was on the end of Gerrard Street, Chinatown. It's now uh, like a, some Irish bar, like oh, oh, some, something like that, yeah. yeah. And uh, it's it was for a big glass window, and it used to be called before that in the sixties. It was called Whiskey A Go Go. Okay. So they changed the name to Wag. They shortened it, mm -hmm. and. Um, Basically, you know, these guys, Chris Sullivan and another guy, Ollie O'Donnell, went to the Whiskey A Go Go. They were on their floor, like, you know, it was dying a death and they took it over and they redeveloped it, like painted the walls with art. And they, they, part, they did something magical there. They brought jazz to the forefront of clubbing and they, they did so many different things. And then I come along and... and shook kind it of, all up. <laughs> well, you know, we started off by doing an, a Tuesday night called Total Fashion Victim. Okay. And it was complete... Fashion Victim. Total Fashion total Victim, victim. TFE, yeah. And we totally... totally uh, It was a piss take out of everybody in fashion because at that time, everyone was head to toe in Yoji Yamamoto, Comedy Garçon. Gautier was the biggest thing. Okay. And it was like, you know, it just come like after New Romantics and, a, and all of that stuff had gone. It was a real fashion-based London. London, everyone loved fashion like they do again now. It's the big labels. But then it was, you know, your three main designers. Yeah, yeah. And if you weren't wearing them, you weren't getting in. So we took that over. We, we just did a piss take night. And then from, on the back of that, I started doing Saturday nights. Mm. Uh, you know, I'm like a cuckoo. They invite me in, and I'd start running the place. And that know? was the that was the main night then Saturday. Saturday night. nights, yeah. And so we had like Nana Cherry. Uh, wow. You know, I gave Mark Moore his first gig there. You know, uh, but uh, we had Tim Simon and did Bomb the Bass. All of the all of the great so it was music. Like disco. Of that it was like yeah, disco we house. we did ha disco house at that point. So yeah. what was so so was rap. Rapping rap was on space. a Friday. They okay. had like Friday nights originally were like rap, and they had jazz, and we kind of just brought the disco and the house to it. And that's just you doing the door DJ, uh, me DJing and okay. doing the. I run the whole thing. You know, it's yeah, like yeah. it was called Fatitude. <laughs> <laughs> you know, then it was called Fat the Wag, and it was like you know, really really good names. Yeah. Uh, so but, basically, you just loved that word fat. It yeah, just, it of just course. Stuck, I, I told you, I owned it, it right. Yeah, yeah. Good. But you know, it was it was it was. We had cues from the door right the way down to Leicester Square every Saturday Amazing. night, and we would be not letting people in. It was just really funny. We'd be off our nuts behind the curtain. Yeah. They had a curtain because it was a, downstairs as a betting shop. Mm -hmm. So wow. they'd put a curtain across the, and they'd pull a blind down over the front of Crazy. Ladbrokes that said wag. And you went up this staircase. So it had that real like Soho feeling. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that Soho feeling has always been around, especially like, even if you look at like, you know, even Soho House in general, yeah. like the no phones yeah. attitude yeah, yeah, yeah. stemmed from Soho in general. So yeah, of course. No one, no one was taking photos back then. So. No one was taking photos back then, thank God. You know, we'd leave, we'd leave the white club and, you know, the, back then it was a 3 a.m. And that was late for people, you know. And then you, to go on, you'd have to go to illegal drinking clubs. Yeah, yeah. And that was Soho. Now, Soho was based on illegal drinking clubs. You'd go to free, there was... Pink Panther, which was the gay one on Wardour Street, <sighs> insane, mm -hmm. insane. Every night of the week, it was run by like these dilly rent boys <laughs> and like like prostitutes. It was it was insane, <laughs> like full and of every night. It was going every up. night you'd go. It was up upstairs on a little room. I had a carpet and it had a hole in the carpet. So when you walked across, <laughs> you go like down the hole, and it was just like. It was just full of trash. It was amazing. We loved it. And do you remember your your, your first gig? Was that was that Wag my Club? No, my first gig was actually at the the Lyceum. Okay. Oh wow. The okay. Lyceum where Lion amazing. King is. Oh, the theatre. Well, yeah, amazing. the theatre. Yeah. Amazing, yeah. So I, I used I <laughs> Lion King. I was sixteen, man, and like uh, this guy, Russ Egan, Steve Strange, they run London at the point in time, and I remember going to them <laughs> and saying they were starting a new night, and I was like, you know what, I'm starting a night the same night as yours, and mm. they were like, why are you doing that? I was like, yeah, everyone's going to come, and they were like, well, why don't you work with us instead? Mm. There was no club, you know, yeah, 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 just course, my mouth. And he was like, uh, why don't you work with us on the door? And I was like, okay, fine. So I started. I told you I'm a cuckoo. I started on the door. You run it, and then I was like, uh, everyone's leaving because the music shit. Mm. And they were like, this guy, this amazing DJ Ian Dewhurst, who was like a real pioneer of of London house and soul disco you know 
amazing DJ, worked for DM, uh, D, uh, like, um, I can't remember who worked for, that's how amazing he was. Mm. But, you know, he basically was DJ and every week I'd be like, oh, everyone's leaving, really early all complaining about the music. And he was like, and well, was that was that true or was that false? No, of course it was, wasn't true. Okay. I, was I made the whole thing, in. it was like me, I never even want you to be a DJ. This is the funny thing about it. I, I have a love for music, I always have. Mm -hmm. And I grew up on... Uh, you know, soul and uh, early reggae and house music. Well, not house, but you know, the, the pretense of the build of it and disco. My mum and dad were really into music. They played, come from a musical background. So music was always in me, but I never ever thought I'm going to become a DJ or a selector, mm -hmm. you know, any of that stuff. And so it wasn't, on, that wasn't on my agenda. <laughs> it was just me trying to be bitchy, basically. And he said, Rusty said, well, if you think you can do better, why don't you do it? And I was like, you know what, I will. So off the week later, I trotted with my little bag with like four records, four 12-inch records. Wow. Just spinning them back to back. Natalie, Natalie Cole, Pink Cadillac, mm -hmm. wow. uh, an ABC track and uh, Divine, mm -hmm. some, I'm not sure what Hot Shot, one of those ones, and some other track. And I played the both sides and that was it. For the whole night. Well, I played like 20 minutes. I've got the, all my friends there, you know, because I let everyone in for nothing. And it was, just, that was how the career started. So what was, so, okay, looking back on it now, what was the, what night do you still rave on about now? Like the party that you... What was the party back forget. then that you, you can't, you know, it's still, it's still a memory? There was so many because, you know, it was like the most creative time. It really was because, you know, we didn't have social media. You didn't have a phone in your hands. So the people were in the moment. Mm -hmm. And I kind of think, you know... um, there were so many amazing clubbing experiences what at that, that time. What was that one party, though, that you just, to this day, you just still memorise? I always like, say it hasn't happened yet. You know what I mean, for me? I yeah. always think, you it's know, because yeah, there's yeah, yeah. so, you know, I can't say to you, oh, my my amazing party. I mean, like, the, literally, uh, there's been so many. Okay. And there have been so many. There's not one defining moment I thought, oh, my God, that's the best party I've ever been to. Because every time I think I've been to the best party, another Something one comes. It. And it's like, you know, you you... you Suddenly you're standing in Donatella Versace's living room DJing and you say, yeah. okay, this, this, is is a bit nothing, better this is better than that one. Yeah. You know, it's kind of, yeah, it's mad. Totally. So we know you like a Ferrucci. What brands right now are you currently obsessed with? Upset Dior. You gave me a funny look when I said Ferrucci. Yeah, just, I know. I know. Like, like, what the, where did you, know, you hear that story from? Oh, that's Ferrucci. for that. that yeah. it's a, I haven't watched it. I was 15. <laughs> <laughs> don't judge me that's, that's Fiorucci, brand's still amazing. Fiorucci's yeah. amazing of course. Yeah. especially early Fiorucci man yeah. they had it they had like, you know the world Italian style it was amazing well yeah. Daniel Fletcher's at Ferrucci now and he's yeah. doing yeah. amazing he's stuff so, so yeah. good so good uh, I'm D Dior of course because of Kim Jones mm -hmm. I absolutely adore um, and just like uh Prada, you don't go wrong with Prada, right? We see those dangerous loafers you stepped in. Yeah, with. you yeah. know that, right? <laughs> Penny loafers. Uh, I, you know what? I love a loafer. Okay. I come from that so era. So you're not, you're you not like said, a... You said you've got a loafer story. I've got a loafer story, yeah. So you're not like I, I'm obsessed by Gucci loafers as well. Okay. I used to collect Lu Gucci loafers. Right. Rogues, Oxfords, uh, Derbies, that's out of the window, strictly Well, loafers. no, I kind of, you know, I've got, I, I got a shoe for every moment. I, mm. I, I, I literally have two lockups of shoes, mm -hmm. right? Oh. When I got clean, right... The, the last day before I went to rehab, I had one pair of shoes and one tooth, <laughs> right? And the shoes I'd stole from some man's house the night before, the trainers. I'd left my busted old trainers and saw he's on the <laughs> way out. And I had them and they were like slightly too small. So I took the insoles out, right? Yeah. You know, that old trick. And I was like busting these trainers around town and I went to treat them and I had one pair of trainers. Today, I probably have thousands of you pairs. To, you need to but, get a photo of that. Uh, well, they're somewhere. in the locker. We're going to sell them all. I'm going to actually do a resale at Selfridges mm -hmm. in June or July uh, for charity. I'm going to take, they're going to have the, the downstairs bit, I think it's going to be the window bit yeah. for two days. And awesome. they're going to sell all my old clothes, all the stuff that I've been sent from companies. Because, you know, it's just like sitting in lockup. Yeah, and you hold it. And it it's it's there, vulgar. Yeah. Mm. It's really vulgar. I don't need that stuff in my yeah. life. It's good that you, yeah, you know, and I'm paying the storage fees on it, and it's just like just sitting there. And I just think, wow. yeah, that can go to really good people, and, and we can earn money for it. Of course, for a good charity. Who was um like your? Story? Oh yeah, you want the loafer story, right? I want the loafer <laughs> oh, story yeah, first. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, quickly. Yeah, so yeah. Uh, I was I went on a trip to New York. And I'd been out for like three days, I think, at this point. And I was in the Joiner's Arms, which used to be in Hackney Road. And it was like nine o'clock in the morning. And I, I'd been up all night. And I was like, oh, and uh, I was putting my stuff in, in the cab. And I had these Gucci loafers on, right? This is towards the very end, right? You can't judge. It was right towards the very end. And I had this thing where I, I was obsessed by gaffer, gaffer tape. 
I would gaffer tape. If my jeans ripped, I would gaffer tape them. Right, this is like the like how insane I was, right? So these loafers that I had, these Gucci loafers, black ones they were, they had a hole like this big in the bottom, like 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 a potato. <laughs> and I'd put cardboard in and I'd gaffer tape them. Right, like in the yeah, bottom. in the bottom, and then gaffer tape them and gaffer tape them so I could carry a win. Like, because I, no, I weren't going to buy new shoes. That was that was that money yeah, was Gucci, right? that money so was going. Go, that was go going go somewhere else. You know yeah. where that money was going, <laughs> yeah. right? And um, so yeah. So anyway, I get invested in a white club. Yeah, yeah, something like that. Yeah, like on pet insurance. So I was like, literally, uh, got to the airport, like mashed and mangled. And they start putting stickers on all my stuff. <laughs> and I was like thinking, mm, it's a bit sus. I've yeah, never had that before. I'd like fly to New York. And, and she was like, they were all really look. I mean, I was spangled, right? <laughs> anyway, they put these little red dots on everything. And I, I get on the plane, I get off at the other end, get a tug at the other end in JFK. And they like take me off to the room. And they strip search me and they take the shoes off, right? And the guy oh, no, is standing I know, I know there. What's like, he's, oh. he's there and he, he thinks he's got a concealment of cocaine yeah. in my shoe, right? Rips it right off. And he takes it off and then he's putting his finger through the hole. And I'm just sitting there with my hair held in shame. Oh and he God. says, They said, How much money have you got on you? And I was like, I've got no money on me. <laughs> so I'm there with like no, no shoes on, like holes this big in my shoes. And they were like, well, Who's going? Well, we don't know. Well, who are you here to work? And I was yeah. like, No, 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 I'm not here to work. I'm, I'm meeting my, bo I meet my boyfriend. Yeah. So it was just, they let me go. They kind of like let me go. They swiped everything. They said, Have you been using cocaine before? And I was like, No, I've been working in nightclubs. Mm -hmm. I mean, I just stank, man. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. Back to the nightclub. So who, yeah. who were the style icons when you was getting ready to go out? Who did you look up? To, to to who was that person and who was that poster on your wall to look like if there, uh, if there was one well, like uh, who would be my idol who was, yeah who would yeah. your style like but, I mean I, I loved those black singers I loved Luther Vandross mm -hmm. I loved Chucka I loved all of that stuff you know I kind of you know when I was a kid growing up I kind of just was like obsessed by Bowie not the music but just by the fashion the image mm -hmm. yeah. yeah I was obsessed by new romantics I, I was just slightly too young for that lot Although most of my friends were from that generation. That's what matured you probably. Yeah, I kind yeah, of growing yeah. up with them. You know, I'm five years younger than the, the, the most no, of them. Hanging out with the ones you. that are still alive. But mm. I'm five years younger than them. So I always, when everyone was 19 or 20, I, I was 15. When I started going clubbing, I was 14. So I used to always pretend I was older than I was. Mm -hmm. You know, so that kind of lie always stayed with me. And then when I got to a certain age, it went down, you know, so, as you yeah. do. But, but yeah, I kind of, so... For me, growing up, those icons were kind of like, I was too young for a lot of stuff. So for me, I just think the ones that I looked up to were either the ones I fancied, you know, for, oh yeah, I'm really into them. Um, or just like literally the, the music that I listened to. Yeah, okay. And away from London nightlife, mm. where was that city, that go-to party place? New York. Yeah. Okay. Every time. Because New York in the eighties and nineties was uh, Studio Fifty Four, yeah. just just on the, after Studio Fifty Four. So I I got a residency at uh, working at a club called the Palladium, of course, which was yeah. Steve's new club. <laughs> like you think this building's big, right? It was the size of one eighty. Okay, wow. you walked in just like outside that rundown old decrepit door. Yeah. Yeah. That's what they had at Palladium. So you went oh, in yeah. for a disused cinema. And it literally had corrugated iron. It was all smashed up. And you went in and you went into this palatial uh, walkway with like marble and white, like like 60 foot high bits of silk hanging down. It was insane. And then you walked into the auditorium, which was an old theatre. And Studio 54 came down from the ceiling. Wow. So at the beginning of the night, when it, the place was half empty, they would bring another club down mm -hmm. and you could go and dance inside the small club and as the dance floor filled up, that went up. That's kind of reminding me of like Bergheim in a way. Well, kind like of, but you know, kind of it. it kind of was, but it was more, you know, they what they did there was they had, they gave every room to a different artist. So there was the, the Kenny Scharf room, oh, wow. there's the yeah. Mike Todd room. There was, you know, there was all these different rooms that so they got artists to decorate. It was, it was really, really brilliantly so, done. Wow. It's like, um, kind of like Pikes then. Yeah, <laughs> no, nothing not like not Pikes. Not, not, no. not like, a bit more tame. Yeah, but still in terms of like the rooms, every yeah, there's like different you know, rooms. Oh yeah, I yeah. know, but I'm on about like literally, right. we're talking about like 400 foot wide rooms, oh, wow, like painted okay. with like like revolving phone boxes and just insane. Like everywhere you walked around the place. And at that point in time, it was it was the start of MDMA. Mm. 
Mm. You know, so to go somewhere like that off you're not on MDA, you're having a good time, <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. So like literally, I would get off the plane, I would go to, to the apartment, the dealer would have already been and I would get my MDMA in little brown <laughs> bottles and we'd do the five dice and off we'd go and we'd literally be in Palladium like in another world. But New York back then was such an incredible creative place. They were obsessed by us. They were obsessed by London. Mm. So that's, you know, but we are, we were obsessed by them every yeah. time we go there. So, you know, it, it was just, it was insane. You know, it was before Giuliano sucked the, the, the life out of it. Mayor Giuliano completely destroyed New York, mm. got rid of all of that 24-hour culture. And, uh, you know, we'd go to places like Save the Robots and there'd be all these insane party clubs down on the, on, on the alphabet. It mm. was amazing. And back to Burgoyne. Yes, I want to hear some stories. I know you've got some stories about Burger and I want to, I want to know. Well, not really. It's not really, you know, um, it's just another club, isn't it? Okay, so that's, a, that's not even, that's not up there with the stories. That's well, no, like, no, no, no. I mean, it's interesting yeah. because when they, whenever you speak to someone, Burger always at the top of their list. Of course it is. It's like the new pulled pork. Yeah. yeah. You know, come on. It's like, oh yeah, I go to Burger Okay, so, so that's the, you're, so, off. So you're, you're basically off. saying it's, Listen, if you'd level. ever gone to turn mills yeah, okay. like 20 years ago, Burger, you Burgheim's lame. Turn Mills now on a Saturday night trade at Turn Mills. You had Muscle Alley, you had the techno or the dance floor, the first lasers. It was insane. You had like 2,000 people in a sweat hole. The toilets were like, like gay orgy parties. It was insane. And that was every Saturday, you know, and they had, you had to have queues of people queuing up to buy drugs off dealers. Mm. Like, it's very openly, mm. and, you know, until it got raided. But, mm. you know, that was kind of like, that was debauched. Everything you see at, and do at, at places like Bergheim has been done before. It's just because course, it's a myth course. now. It's become a very good urban legend. And I think yeah. for us, that's that's what we grew up on. When we go to uh, yeah, a big night out, it's a Bergheim or something like that. Yeah, of course. Because you, that's, yeah. What you, that's what, you know, the magazines and what people tell you you should do. Of yeah. Have you ever been to Bergheim though and not gotten into Bergheim? Oh yeah, I went downstairs. <laughs> you, oh. <laughs> Look at that. You should leave that one out. <laughs> <laughs> but has there ever been a point in, in your party life where you ever thought, you know what, I'm going to stay at home and put my feet up? Was there ever that moment? Stick on the kettle and watch No, there was never, you know what? It kind of, um, what the first, from the minute, first time I ever went to a club, I, d I knew that was going to be my life. I knew, I thought, okay, I've arrived, this is it. I never want this to stop. Yeah. And that was the problem. Because as much as I got addicted to alcohol and to drugs, I was addicted to clubbing. Mm. It was like the third part, you know, the, of it. So I, I never want, ever wanted to stay in. And it's only now that I appreciate, um, quality time at home with my dog and my partner i really I really do appreciate that time because you know uh, i'm i've spent a lifetime just rushing yeah. <laughs> on one thing or another and to one thing or another and it's kind of now i'm like you know got to the stage where you know i've just gone for a year like on and off of, of wanting to work and now we're like so much work's coming and i'm getting resentful about it i'm like oh god i can't do that today it shows you what's important doesn't yeah it? it really does and you know just you know, people go, oh, how do you wind down? I'm like, I watch TV because I just zone out. Yeah. I don't even know what I'm watching. I just zone out. And I kind of go into like a meditated state and then I fall asleep. It's, it's I, 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 as I say, you know, my, the way I am, it's like, I'm like, blah, 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 blah. and then as soon as I, I don't know how to stop. Mm. I never have known how to stop. So when I do stop, I have a crash. Right, or I kind of get in that place. Like I, I can go on on a Friday night, and when the clubs and everything's open, I can. If I have a weekend off, I will go on to social media on Saturday morning, and I will hate the world. Yeah. Why am I at home? Oh my god, my career's over. Yeah. I'm old. It's that's over for me. That's the FOMO. Yeah, of course with, it's the FOMO. Yeah. But you know what? I, I've been doing it all my life. It's like why am I? Why, I don't care about yeah, that. Of course. Yeah. Do you know? Yeah. But now I get, I get JOMO now. The joy of missing out. Yeah, right? I haven't you heard know. that one before. JOMO. Jomo's good. Jomo's like being at home and thinking, you know look I'm at you so lot. You know, you know what I mean? I'm at so happy that I'm at home. It's yeah. amazing. Listen, well, we can't wait to see you play live. I've never seen you play. I've heard... I've heard. You've been living under a stone, man. Literally, yeah. I've heard, the, I've heard the, the joys are very real. Yeah. So yeah. Hopefully this summer we get to see you play. I hope you do. You know, yeah. I'm, I'm actually going to be doing... I think I'm doing uh, So House actually on... The 24th. Amazing. We might see you there then. Yeah, I'm headlining for them. They they <laughs> rang me yesterday and asked. But yeah, 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 come and see me, man. I'm all over all over the shop this summer. Amazing. Like some really good stuff coming up, you know, like 
let's hope that we get some form of new Come normality, yeah. right? I just what the joy, the the, the energy. I, I've missed that energy of watching people dance and that energy that you get from that as a DJ. Mm. It's not about playing records. It's about feeding off that energy, totally, and it's totally. been really difficult feeding off yuccas and palm trees in a garden while I've Yo. been doing live sets. You know. Totally. Well, listen, thank you so much for coming. Thank we've you, got, guys. We've actually got some flowers to give you. Oh, you know, actually. I'm a flower obsessed person. Yeah, have them in every know. room. Oh, thank you so much. Oh, there he is. You, they've been around a while. <laughs> <laughs> still Did you get them last week? Yeah, two months still ago. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much, Tony, man. We know you're Thank you. You're Seriously, man. Incredibly busy individual. Yeah. Thank so, you yeah. for having me.